Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. Just how much nerve does it take to stage a play in Shakespearean blank verse, featuring most of the current royal family and several spectral appearances by Princess Diana? Rupert Gould can tell us this morning, because he's just done that at the Almeida Theatre in London. Mike Bartlett's King Charles III describes a constitutional crisis triggered after the Prince of Wales steps into his mother's shoes and decides to test the limits of his power. Also on the programme today, constitutional and legal battles in the Georgian period. Lucy Worsley is here to talk about her new television series, The First Georges, in which she argues that the Hanoverians laid the foundations of modern Britain. And the writer Paula Byrne with the fascinating story of a young black woman who lived with one of George II's Lord Chief Justices and may have played a quiet part in bringing an end to slavery. We start, though, in the arena for some of the most intense battles between ministers and monarchs, the subject of Chris Bryan's book, Parliament, the biography. Um, Chris, in terms of public esteem, I would guess that uh, royalty has edged ahead of uh, Parliament just at the moment. I, he- I actually heard it described as the Palace of Sexminster this morning. Um, your, your biography uh, is explicitly an attempt to redress the balance a bit, isn't it? Well, it's just trying to put it all in context, really. I mean, I, I started because somebody once asked me, who were the very first commoners that we know came to a parliament? And uh, I came across a list uh, in October 1258, 14 names, including Walt Disney's great, 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 something or other. Um, and, uh, and, and the only reason we know they came to parliament is because they had their expenses paid and we've got their expenses sheet, as it were. The king insisted that they be paid. And interestingly... He didn't want them just to be paid two shillings a day, which is what they'd have been paid to go to war, but four shillings a day because he wanted really good people to come to Parliament. Um, so I, I think sometimes we, could, we should just set things in context. Um, and, and the other thing for me was there are so many myths about Parliament. I mean, one of the phrases that gets used and often bastardised is um, Parliament, Westminster is the mother of Parliaments. In fact, there was an article in The Guardian the other day that used this yet again. It's never been the mother of Parliaments. The oldest... Um, Parliament in the world, Representative Assembly, is the Althingi of Iceland. The Tinwald in the Isle of Man is older than Westminster, and Ireland had statute law before England. So I, I just think sometimes we need to get the facts right so that we can better understand our role in the world. Um, you were also um, very explicit about how contingent much of this is. We think of it as a sort of glorious progress of, um, of resolute um, advancement towards greater democracy, but there's a lot of chance and contingency in there as well, isn't there? A, a great deal. Well, And the Victorians, I think, deliberately wanted to suggest that it had all been a great progression and towards the, the you know, perfect um, settlement under the, under the British Empire. Um, but if if you, I mean, Queen Victoria, for instance, she only became monarch because not only had her father and her grandfather died, but three cousins and three uncles as well. Now, if that wasn't an episode of kind hearts and coronets in the making, I don't know what was. Um, but, but perhaps the best example is habeas corpus, one of the laws that we all rely on, namely that the king cannot arrest you without due reason, without fair trial, um, only came into existence because at third reading in the House of Lords, um, uh, when there were the, uh, the teller for the contents, those in favour of the bill, counted a very fat peer for 10 votes. And so it was, it was won by 57 votes to 55, even though there weren't that many in the room. Um, I'm going to have to press you. It's such a wonderful story. Most listeners will assume it's apocryphal. But the, the, the teller statistics bear it out, don't they? Yes, it's absolutely true. I mean, I've been through the list and counted how many people there were, how many bishops there were, how many peers, how many dukes and, and, and all the rest of it. And there just were not enough people in the room to have made 57 plus 55. Um, we're talking a lot, uh, uh, I mean, we've been talking a lot about scandals. I mean, that's the other uh, element of perspective, that um, when you're talking about expenses, uh, I, was, I was fascinated to read about, you know, a period in which it was more usual for the MPs to pay the electorate uh, in order to get into Parliament. It's a much worse system, actually. Uh, uh, yes, yes, <laughs> quite. Well, so will you, there were, there were, MPs were paid up until Andrew Marvell, he was um, the last MP paid by his constituency until the modern era, 1911. Um, but then you had this period where, like Sir William Paxton, who wanted to win the seat in Carmarthen uh, County, was paying out for thousands of breakfasts and lunch and gallons of wine and all the rest of it, and still lost the seat. Um, he won the next year in, the, in, a, in another um, in the general election. But um, and in in the Georgian area, 
uh, Mr Roberts was at the end of every parliamentary session would literally stand outside the, the door to Westminster Hall and any MP who had been helpful to the government during the year would get £800 slipped into their hands with the squeeze of a hand. But also the Speaker would quite openly take payments to favour legislation. In the uh, yes, though John period. Trevor got into terrible... He was One of the reasons that the Speaker names people in the House of Commons today when, he's, when he calls you to speak um, by your name rather than your constituency or anything else is because John Trevor was cross-eyed and so people didn't know who he was asking to call next. Uh, but anyway, he was done over in 1695 uh, for trying to help the City of London Corporation Orphans Bill, which wasn't very good for orphans, it was good for the City, of Corpora City Corporation, um, through Parliament. You've got a thousand guineas. Um, we're talking a lot about the Georgians today, and it is a particularly interesting period in Parliament, the, the Georgian period, isn't it? It's a, a period when a lot of current sort of practices start to evolve. You see them emerging. But yes. then almost by accident in some... Well, I mean, an awful lot of stuff in history has happened by, by accident. But, but interestingly, just before the Georgian era happens, we nearly ended up with the American style of separating the executive from the legislature because in 1713, the Place Bill, which would have taken all government ministers out of Parliament, out of the Commons, out of the House of Lords, um, just before George I arrives, um, that falls because the vote is tied in the House of Lords at third reading and a tie in the House of Lords at third reading means that the, the bill falls. Um, Lucy Worsley, I want to bring you in. George II, the absent king, uh, is partly responsible for cabinet government, isn't he? Because you, he, he leaves the country so often simply because he can't stand being here and he'd much rather go back to Germany. So he leaves behind him a vacuum which is then filled... Filled by Sir Robert Walpole. Well, it's George the first who sort of um, is, is the, the first of the Georgian kings who's always popping off to Hanover. And this is an argument that, that is often made, that if the king is away, then Walpole can play, and they have to sort of deal with an absent monarch. But as Chris said earlier, interestingly, um, it, we, we've always got to take care that we don't fall into the Whig narrative trap, that everything mm. that happens in Britain is a step towards the future greatness, and, you know, um, we have the mother of all parliaments. And I really like the fact that it's funny little things like the king's personal preference for his homeland that allow institutions that seem timeless and somehow right to develop. Um, it's a fascinating period too because you have um, you have um, George II complaining ministers of the kings now. Uh, there's a kind of wildcat strike almost of ministers when Pelham tries to get um, William Pitt in as Secretary of War. Uh, and George II doesn't like this idea so he says I'm not going to have that. And all of the ministers walk out and George II has to change his mind. So he has limited powers, but he then can dissolve Parliament, rig the elections. Oh, well, well, rigging the elections is the big thing, because the Whigs would always manage to win the borough seat. There were two kinds of seats. There were county seats, where there was a large electorate and it very expensive to buy. Um, and then there were borough seats, many of which either personally belonged to the Prince of Wales, his um, uh, sort of controllers uh, as the Duke of Cornwall, or, or to individual um, sort of magnates in the land. Uh, and, and so it was really easy to win those seats and win the House of Commons. And the king gave out vast quantities of money to enable that to happen. But can, I, can yeah. I just say about George II, people often say he's a king in toils, he's a king who was no good, but part of that reputation has come from a really interesting fact, which is the survival of his correspondence. George III wrote loads of letters, absolutely scribbled away the whole time. George II, we don't have a single central archive of his letters, and that's because if you wrote to him, what he would do is write his answer back on your letter and send it back to you. So and the only reason we know about the 1376 good parliament is because two MPs wrote a, an, a, an account of how the first speaker was ever appointed. Um, Paula Byrne, you're, you're writing about it sort of outside parliament where there's a, a great deal going on in the courts and, and legislation. It's a very kind of different, it's a sort of extraneous forms of power, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. So I'm writing about Lord Mansfield, who was a Lord Chief Justice, um, and his niece, his um, mixed race biracial niece, Dido Bell. Um, but I'm thinking, just just coming back to this thing about um, and, and thinking about Rupert and political freedom and, and the power of the press. Um, I think one of the great acts of censorship in the 18th century was the Royal Licensing Act, which um, was so significant in terms of prohibiting um, political satires on the stage. And you mentioned Robert Walpole before. The Licensing Act came about as a direct result of Henry Fielding, the great novelist, satirising Robert Walpole, and that is why the Licensing Act 
that came about. I and mean, I was just thinking about that in terms of Rupert and your your play about censorship. <laughs> yeah, you'd have been you'd have been in the blocks for certain. <laughs> you, Rupert. you really would. I mean, <laughs> this play would, if play not would never have got on. It would never have got on. Your play would not be put on in the eighteenth century. It could except, not have been put on. Except there's a reason. but there's a strange paradox, isn't there? Because we also think of the Georgian period as a great flourishing of of political satire at the same time. The moment at which all of this is invented and you're, you're, uh, it's a legacy, your play, uh, or rather Mike Bartlett's play, which you've um, directed, of that form of comment. Yes, yeah, so, uh, I don't think we ever set out to, to satirise the royal family per se in, in, in an 18th century um, mode, but... Um, I mean, our, uh, our play probably would have been banned much more recently than, than that uh, in the, the Lord Chamberlain's day, and uh, uh, still, still to see in an, in an age where the stage is full of blood and sex and uh, all sorts of atrocities, actually seeing the idea of a deposed monarch seems seems genuinely provocative still, and I think uh, has a satirical bite of another kind. Well, it certainly would have been a capital offence to imagine the death of. Uh, of a monarch in in Shakespeare's well, time, forecast. it isn't anymore. To no, for, uh, well, to, the second Duke of Buckingham was sent to prison, um, and for exactly that, forecasting the death of the king, um, it has all been trumped up by the Earl of Clarendon. But uh, and when he came out, he became a great national hero. And there's also the famous case when Shakespeare was nearly chucked into prison um, because his company put on a production of Richard II, the Earl of Essex, asked, and Rupert will know about this, and the Earl of Essex asked Shakespeare to put on a private production of Richard II because he was about to march into the streets and try to depose Elizabeth. And the authorities were absolutely furious and he nearly got thrown into prison. So it seems to me that the theatre has always been really interesting in terms of political freedom and lack of censorship. And the, the great contradiction in the Georgian ages, on the one hand, you're absolutely right to say there was great sort of political political freedom in the press and with Lord Mansfield the press are constantly getting on his back saying come to a decision about slavery um, and yet in the stage there's a censorship and that's the wonderful well, thing about you, the Georgian age have... it's, a, it's a period of contradictions uh, I want to come back to you Rupert I mean we were talking about um, Shakespeare and political theatre uh, I'm pretty sure with with this play King Charles III you probably weren't nervous about putting the the king and queen on stage, spitting image have done it, it's not a problem anymore. You must have been nervous about doing a play in Shakespearean blank verse. That must have been an, an edgier first night than most, surely. Yes, we had no idea how it would be received, but um, I think Mike Bartlett, who's, who's the writer, um, has a very healthy approach to playwriting, which is that he won't approach any subject until he feels the form represents the subject, and uh, he wanted to explore national identity through the monarchy and... Um, uh, our idea of kings and queens and, and uh, blank verse seem the appropriate form. I thought you got um, p pretty good reviews, I have to say, yeah. really good reviews. Um, but the word that kept cropping up was bold, which I always feel is a critic's euphemism for I'm not entirely sure whether this worked, but I think it did, and I don't know what my colleagues are going to say yet. <laughs> yes. So I'll call it bold, you know, <laughs> as an insurance well, it was funny because we, we, the, the play for a long time had the working title The Death of Queen Elizabeth II, which in many ways was more provocative. And uh, I, I think our starting point was to try and imagine what this, this sort of future moment will be and, and how the nation will feel at the death of the current monarch and uh, uh, whether it will feel the same as the way people talk about Churchill's death and the state funeral of Churchill being sort of the end of a, uh, the age of deference in, in British national identity. And uh, I think Prince Charles is a very um, Shakespearean figure, a man who's sort of caught between two different times, uh, an individual with his own agenda, but under the pressures of... Uh, uh, a new media age. He's probably uh, an ideological political figure in some senses, a, a man of the 60s, and yet probably by the time uh, he exceeds, uh, that that agenda will have moved on. So um, uh, I think both Richard II and, and Henry IV, of course, were, were, were big influences on, on what I, we did. I think that's the, one of the most interesting moments in the plays because it starts, and of course, an audience is a little uncertain what to do with the blank verse mm -hmm. at first. There's a, quite a bit of laughter, mm -hmm. um, intentional in, mm -hmm. in most cases. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you, you arrive at this moment where there's a, there's a sort of dis a discussion between Harry, who's a sort of Prince Hal figure. Mm -hmm. He's always off in into, into the stews. Mm -hmm. And he has a conversation with a kebab seller. Mm -hmm. And the kebab seller says, you know, nobody's going to know what to do when the Queen dies. And I thought that it was an odd moment in the theatre because everybody th I thought, actually, that may be true. Yeah, so what it's do we, a continuity. It, we don't think of the death of a monarch as being destabilising anymore, but 
It might be. Absolutely. And it was based very specifically on a, a scene in Richard II when uh, the Queen overhears two gardeners talking about uh, the execution of conspirators. Uh, and there's a long extended metaphor about pruning an apricot um, uh, hedge and how uh, a judicious monarch prunes back uh, um, trees in an insurrection. And I, I said to Mike the writer, well, it, what, it, what is our version of that in, in 21st century London and uh, the idea of a sliced kebab was the, uh, the equivalent go, go bind thou up dan, <laughs> dangling exactly. got it. Yeah. but I actually thought it was a bit more like brother John Bates um, in um, Henry V when mm -hmm. the soldiers round the yes. campfire the night yeah, before yeah, yeah. Agincourt anniversary yeah. next year um, talk to Harry and tell yeah. him the truth about war yeah, well, it's interesting. When I, when I was at the Royal Shakespeare Company, we used to put together a sort of set of notes about Shakespearean dramaturgy. And, and the great thing about Shakespeare is, he, in almost all his plays, he mixes the highest uh, courtly characters with the the lowest sort of street life. And, and it's something that actually in contemporary drama we don't do very often, or not nearly as much as we ought to, I think. Um, because we'd been reading so much about the Georgians um, leading up to this week, I was very struck by the, the comparison with um, Addison's Cato, mm. which was nobody. Nobody would perform anymore, but was a huge hot ticket in the day. Yours has now become a hot ticket, I think, mm -hmm. over the weekend, because the reviews were good enough. It, it's interesting, isn't it? You can have a play which somehow just seizes the moment or mm. seizes a, a topic that's in the air or just about to crystallise in the air. You don't need to have a play that's going to last forever. You just have, need to have a play that works on that night and for the... Yeah, I, I, I think audiences are hungry for argument and... Uh, uh, you know, subtext is sort of the the, the holy grail, I guess, of, of most dramatists. But the, the great thing about the blank verse is it allows rhetoric and dialectic to really exist. And this is a play about argument as well as a satire on the on the royal family. It's really about what the monarch's role is in in, in a, in a non constitutional government, and um, that the verse really serves that. I was surprised by how little it's a satire on the royal family. I mean, you, there are some jokes, as it were, about our common perceptions of them, but um, it seems uh, deeply empathetic to Charles. Um, Actually, I thought quite sympathetic to Kate as well, who mm. who plays a sort of significant role. Some critics saw her as Lady Macbeth, but I didn't. I thought I she was. I saw her as Lady Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her as Lady Macbeth. I don't know about you, Lucy. A bit more milk of human kindness, but. Uh, Paula Byrne, you've read the play, you haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, I'm, sadly, I, I, I've read the play, but I, I mean, I, I thought it was absolutely wonderful and I thought the women were really strong and uh, the portrayal of Kate, I mean, even though I haven't seen it, I still felt she was so poised. <laughs> There's just something about the blank verse and the way she talks and she, I think she is a Lady Macbeth figure. She's quite yeah. sinister, surely. Well, yeah, well, she, uh, she, in form maybe, but I think that the, when we were working on the play, we... She comes from a middle class background, and I think what uh, Mike Barlett is trying to do is is say that this is a company, it's a business, the royal family, and she's arriving and, and saying potentially the way it's being run and the the chief executive as posed by the play isn't effective. What do you do about that? You either go bust or you make change. The only um, character I didn't believe, sorry, was um, the Tory prime, the Tory leader of the opposition because <laughs> he was scheming, manipulative, <laughs> uh, lying, um, ghastly man. I, I just couldn't see that that could possibly be true. No recognition. I had a little problem of um, uh, belief that Prince Charles would be... Um, a, a defender of press liberty. Mm. Um, I mean, I uh, satisfactorily made the suspension of mm. judgment, but it was interesting that you chose mm. Leveson because that's mm. the bill that comes through that he he essentially says, I'm not going to sign this until you change it. And that's what precipitates the whole crisis of the play, isn't it? Yes, and I, I think, you know, we're very aware that it's uh, ostensibly an unlikely bill for, for Charles to, to um, take issue with. But... Um, it, I think uh, Mike Bartlett's sense of Prince Charles as a character and potentially based on, on the real figure as well is that he is uh, a defender of liberty. Uh, he, he already, I think, has uh, expressed his, a desire to be a defender of the faiths, I think, um, when he becomes king. And so he, he is sort of inclusive at some level. And um, uh, so so while the specific issue, particularly in relation to, I suppose, what happened to Diana is, um, is controversial, um, I certainly think the press have, have responded to it. Um, the, the the one remaining power he has is this is this negative power to withhold, you know, as it were, the ceremonial mm -hmm. signature, and mm -hmm. also he thinks to dissolve Parliament. He can't. Can he dissolve Parliament? He certainly can't now. Um, <laughs> though the, the mo there's an irony in as so much of the British Constitution, the only person who can dissolve Parliament is the King, but it now happens automatically. Um, it's a bit like a royal assent. The last monarch to refuse royal assent was Queen Anne. So even before the Hanoverians, um, when she turned down the Scotch militia bill, um, and everybody groaned, and it's never been done since. But there's no act of parliament that says the monarch can't do it. 
I mean, what's interesting in the Georgian period is that's repeatedly how he exerts power, isn't he? If the parliament isn't going in the right direction, he'll just dissolve it or prorogue it. Well, th that happens quite a bit, but but more frequently, actually, of course, what's happened in the history is you just make more members of the House of Lords, um, so, which the <laughs> government's doing again at the moment. But, you know, Queen Anne put in 20 extra Tory peers to vote through the Treaty of Utrecht um, and uh, in the, the to get the Great Reform Bill through the same in the House of Lords was the threat anyway. They call uh, it having the power of men, not measures, don't they? Yes, exactly. But it's fascinating, Women Lucy Worsley, well. isn't it? How, how many of these historical... I mean, the Act of Settlement still leaves it its trace in current constitutional arrangements, or at least in our notion of current constitutional arrangements. And we've, we've, there have been changes made recently so that the, the, the king now can marry a Catholic, great sort of overturning of the Act of Settlement, but still cannot be a Catholic. Yes, right uh, well, say. yes, indeed. I mean, that... I thought they should have gone a bit further in, in, in the reforms that we've done on the, on the Act of Settlement. But the point is, I suppose, that in the end, everything is contingent and sometimes you have to turn things upside side down. So we were talking about the freedom of the press. The, the only reason that it was, used to be illegal to publish what went on in the House of Commons or the House of Lords was that MPs needed secrecy to be able to protect themselves from having their head chopped off by Henry VIII or whichever monarch it was. So they enforced it on themselves. But then, of course, that became a means of um, preventing the populace from knowing what was going on. So John Wilkes then uh, famously expelled from Parliament four times, re-elected by the good burghers of, uh, of Middlesex on that fight for the freedom of the press to report what happened in Parliament. Uh, and John, John Wilkes very often cited actually in arguments about Leveson and freedom of the press now his name keeps keeps coming up Lucy Worsley are we in a unusually Georgian period at the moment we've got well, yeah. anxieties about um, Scotland and union we've got um, sort of anxieties about press freedom and so on we're in an unusually Georgian period just because everybody's gone Georgian mad for the last month because it's the start of the well it's a tercentenary anyway exactly. but <laughs> it seems to have coincided with a period in which some of our preconceptions and our, our concerns are actually mirroring concerns of the Georgians. Yeah, yeah. Well, the 18th century is often referred to as the century that made us. And things like satire and the, the Scottish Enlightenment and the abolition of... Well, it wasn't in the 18th century. But yes, many, many sort of key issues seem to have been sorted out in a way that's still recognisable. And if you look around the fabric of Britain, all those things like the city of Bath and the skyline of Windsor Castle, the visual brand of Britain, if you like, is a Georgian creation. What... You, you say at the beginning of your television series, and it was something I wanted slightly to take issue with, we owe so much to these German kings who made Britain. And I just want to ask you, is that not, um, as it were, mistaking the silver lady on the Rolls Royce for the thing that's actually driving it? I mean, she leads, but it, it's, not, it's not the thing that's driving the car. The kings didn't actually make the changes. They were the ornament and it was happening behind the scenes. But you know what? They allowed the changes to happen. And I think that... Um... Did they have any choice? <clears throat> Well, yes and no. I think that one of the, the great misconceptions about the Georgian kings themselves that's widely held is that they were German, grumpy, indistinguishable from each other and not very good at their job. And it is true that they only became kings through sort of biological accident, the failure of the line of the Stuarts with, with Queen Anne who had... A, a very, oh, it's a horrible thought, 18 children, and none of them actually survived her. So along, along they come from Germany. Huge expectation and pressure upon them. And the thing is, they're royal by the invitation of Parliament and the Whig establishment and the aristocracy. They're obviously not royal by absolute right of blood because nearer relations of Anne's are passed over on the grounds that they're Almost Catholic. 50. And there's, there's about 50 <laughs> of them. <laughs> so here they are coming into this very difficult job where they know that they could be sacked at any moment. And Parliament, having, you know, obtained this pet new royal family, seeks further to divide and rule by stirring up trouble between the generations. And we get these wonderful, fabulously dysfunctional family stories in the Hanoverian royal family that I probably don't have time to tell you now, but they are just great. And even at the time, Parliament wanted to minimise their power and say, right, we're in control now. And that is a sort of impression that still remains to this day. Uh, it's not just that they could be sacked, they could be expelled, uh, possibly even killed. It's a very unstable time. The Jacob they, I mean, within a year, there's a, the first Jacobite rebellion. Yes, yes. Uh, and, the, and, and it doesn't go away, that. It's a constant anxiety as to where loyalties really lie. Yes, yes, it, it was. Um, people describe the situation as being on a knife edge. Um, it's, it's by no means clear that they are going to survive for quite as long as they did. And in 1745, they really do show themselves to be capable of using 
incredible brutality to put down opposition. And the Battle of Culloden is still a very, um, it's a very sensitive subject. If you say Duke of Cumberland to a Scottish person, they're very likely to spit because of the slaughter of the Highlanders. So the Georgians do reveal that they have an iron fist inside that velvet glove. And in what I'm interested in art and cultural history, um, they sometimes get criticised for saying, well, they didn't build Versailles, they weren't splashing the cash, but that's what all the absolute dynasties of Europe did. And do you know what? They got revolted against. And the Georgian kings sort of took culture out there into the city and they allowed Handel and the opera houses and satire to flourish. And they took part in it themselves. They went to the opera. The one thing I slightly disagreed with about the thesis of, of, the, pro, of the first programme which we've seen was that uh, I think England in particular was quite used to having foreign rulers... I mean, they thought of the Stuarts as foreigners from Scotland. Um, they thought and hadn't united the two parliaments. They'd united the crowns, of course. And William of Orange, of course, was, was not by any stretch of the imagination British. And, and actually, if you go way back to the beginning, the first guy to invite anybody along a commoner to Parliament was Simon de Montfort. We all say it that way, but he was really Simon de Montfort. He was completely and utterly French. But it was, oh, yeah. there was a perce- perception that George the, the First was a foreigner. They waved turnips at him, didn't they? <laughs> 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 but, well, how did he become George instead of Georg? I mean, that's the, if, we'd, if we'd kept on calling them Georg, maybe we'd have... Uh, but but what, what you're, what, what's new in the 18th century, as Linda Colley wrote in her book Britons, is that this nation of, of Britain was being established. So there was a sense that, yeah, OK, perhaps we ought to be one nation uh, instead of this great mass of Mongolness that we were up until the 18th century. I want to go back to the dysfunctional family because another um, uh, connection with the modern world is this fascination with the royal family. I mean, it was written about, it was talked about, it wasn't a sort of sense of, you know, that couldn't be mentioned. Uh, there was great fascination in the country about, you know, the Georges rowing with various Prince of Wales and... And they were always rowing, weren't they? Mm. Now, it's part of a matter of technology. Um, you get this wonderful um, invention, the, the pamphlet. So everybody can read about all of this, and it's very easy to, to yeah. get hold yeah, of. there's a massive explosion in print culture. So there are just not just pamphlets and books and essays, um, but there's newspapers springing up all over the place. Um, cartoonists, scatological cartoons that show father against son. And it's very Shakespearean, very Henry IV. Um, and it was a great time for that. And of course, famously, George III fought with, with George IV. But it goes, I mean, in your first programme, you talk about that terrible story about um, George and, 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 and the dysfunctional family relationship between him and his son and his son's wife. Yes, well, George I um, appears in England with a new wife. What's happened to his wife? Well, she has been locked up in a remote German castle for her adultery. And her 11-year-old son, the future George II, never saw his mother again after that. So it's very tempting to do a bit of cod psychology here and say this is a personal reason that they hate each other. But then also there's a political layer to that. If you're a politician and you can't get a job with George I, well, what do you do? You go off to the parties of the Prince of Wales instead, and that's called the reversionary interest, and it's a massive feature of 18th century politics. And the Prince of Wales has much better parties, it has to be said. At his parties, people have so much fun that some virgins conceive. <laughs> Good trick if you can do it. Um, th- that's um, the other really? element of the Wigger. <laughs> that's the other element it's of the Wigger. Very tawdry this m- early in the morning. <laughs> well, yeah, the Palace of Sexminster. We were talking about it earlier. Not in um, my experience, anyway. <laughs> the, um, that's a feature of the Wigger ascendancy, isn't it? The, we, we, you, you talk of the Wigger ascendancy in this long period of them being in power, but of course, the instant a, a political party gets secure it splits and starts to argue with itself and there's an enormous amount of internal... There's uh, a lot of wig-on-wig action. That is <laughs> certainly true. Um, during you're, the, you're taking the things down years. again. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> but no. <laughs> uh, no, it's true, but, 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 but the point is, of course, that when George arrives, he thinks that the best way to secure his long-term interest is only to appoint wigs to government and it's entirely up to him who the ministers are. And so, so he helps sort of buttress himself with this massive Whig party a monopoly, and you could argue that that is just as prone to arbitrary rule um, as an individual Stuart monarch was. And it's these Whigs who wrote the history of this period. Yes. And it's their account that still dominates. Exactly. Walpole's son and, you know, and other relatives. Uh, but, but, the, but, but still what comes through is the phenomenal corruption. Um, I mean, when Walpole comes to power in 1720, effectively as Prime Minister, the first properly constituted Prime Minister, though the, 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 it never gets into statute law till the 20th century, the concept of Prime Minister, um, it's partly because he's managed to screen off 
um, from public ire all those who'd been involved in the South Sea bubble, which included every senior member of the government. Every senior member. Three of them die, um, possibly one at his own hand, um, two others, one of smallpox and one having had a stroke in the House of Lords. Um, and then he has to mount a massive protection measure to make sure that they're not impeached in the House of Lords. Yeah, it's a huge, I mean, it appears actually in the Hogarth Prince at the time, doesn't it? The South Sea bubble, of, I mean, almost brings the country to its knees. And he makes thousands and thousands of pounds as Prime Minister and, and doles out jobs to everybody in his family. I hate it because he's responsible for stage censorship. <laughs> it, it was his battle, as I said, with Henry Fielding that caused the theatres. And, 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 you know, that, well, it, caused, it gave rise to the novel, which is a great thing, but in terms of plays, yes, there could be no upside. political satires. Well, there is that side. And Henry Fielding turned to the novel because Walpole was, was, was curtailing him at every point. Um, Lucy Worsley, I want to come back just to this question of, of um, uh, Hanoverian uh, patronage because, I mean, they, they were patrons. Uh, they were patron, uh, you know, patrons of Handel and so on. But it was largely by retiring, wasn't it? I mean, Hogarth is a, a self-created man. He's not, as he would have been, say, a century earlier, um, created by a court and, and sustained by a court. He issues subscriptions. People, exactly People so, buy yes. the tickets yes. and then they pay for it. And it's pure free enterprise. Well, this is one of the novel features of the 18th century, the artist as entrepreneur. And uh, Princess Caroline, for example, um, in the past, she, would, she was very interested in books. She was my fav favourite queen, Princess, and then Queen Caroline, partly because she was such a bookworm. And what she would have done, perhaps, in the 17th century is employ a writer, direct patronage. OK, you're on, my, you're on my payroll, write your book. But now what she does is that she attaches her name at the head of a list of subscribers. So it's more of a... It's like crowdfunding. Yeah. The idea is taken out and a whole lot of people get behind it. And if you've got a fashionable name at the top of your list, list of subscribers, it's going to be a success because yeah. everybody else wants to have the, the same collection. Exactly so. Uh, Paula Byrne, we're talking a little bit about fashion, not, perhaps not fashionable society, but your, your uh, book begins with a portrait, a Zoffany portrait, mm -hmm. a rather famous Zoffany portrait uh, called the Double Portrait. Mm -hmm. It used to hang in Kenwood House, not anymore. Mm -hmm. um, tell us why it sort of triggered a whole book. Well, it's an extraordinary painting, as you say. It's a double portrait of what appears to be um, two women. One may be her maid. She's a mixed, a biracial, beautiful woman in the background, in motion, striding in front of her. Is this very blonde, pale um, woman who looks like her mistress. And in fact, they weren't. They were brought up as sisters. They were cousins. They were the great nieces of Lord Mansfield. It's an extraordinary double portrait. There, I don't think there's any portrait that represents a biracial racial woman as an equal to a white woman. Yes, I mean, one of the unusual things is she's wearing... Uh, her costume is as sumptuous. Oh, you know, she's if not, not more wearing, fashionable. Yeah. If not more fashionable, she's wearing this very fashionable ostrich feather, um, which Georgiana made very uh, fashionable. They were very expensive. Um, and she's dressed very elaborately. She's wearing these gorgeous pearl earrings and this beautiful silk dress. Um, she's fashionably dressed. Um, and she's... And you just... The eye is irresistibly drawn to this gorgeous biracial woman and she, as I say she's in motion she's dazzling she's vital um, I think the poor I think the artist fell in love with her well a lot of people did and, and it was rumored that Lord Mansfield did <laughs> uh, you know in yep. a platonic way I um, mean he had her as a sort of daughter though though some made scurrilous suggestions that yeah there was, a, that. there was how did she end up gossip. in his household um, she was his great niece um, so um, her, she was the daughter of a slave and a Royal Naval Captain John Lindsay, who was Mansfield's nephew. And she was brought over to England in, in 1761. And the Mansfields were childless. This is Lord Mansfield, the great Lord Chief Justice, one of the most powerful men in the kingdom, who owned this wonderful place called Kenwood House. And he brought up Dido Bell, this beautiful girl, to be his daughter, alongside Elizabeth Murray, who was also motherless. So the two girls were brought up together as equals, cousins, beloved, beloved family members. And it was extraordinary. This is a time... I mean, there were 15,000 black people living in England at the time. That's not, Make no mistake about there's another side to Georgian life than the one we're talking about here. Um, but Dido Bell was unusual because she was brought up as an aristocrat. She was well educated. She played the piano. She was accomplished. Um, she was beautiful. And I think she probably she had a huge influence on Lord Mansfield, who was of course the judge associated with the abolition of the slave trade. Well, let's talk. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, Wait, Lucy Worsley, you wanted to. Um, what what I think I've learnt from your book, what what I think has changed my mind is 
I always thought that she was in some way treated in, a, in an inferior way in the household, that her status was a little bit ambivalent. But you're coming forward quite strongly and saying, no, nope, it, was, it was better than we think. She was treated absolutely equal. Absolutely. And I think that there is some ambiguity because, and the reason was that because an American visitor came for dinner and she wasn't in, as part of the dinner party. She came in for coffee afterwards. And this has led to all sorts of speculation about, oh, she wasn't quite good enough to sit at the dinner table, which is just rubbish. They were probably protecting her as much as anything else. They're extro- extremely proud and fond of her. Things like... We, he, re- he wrote a rather racist... Um, he wrote a very racist uh, account. Yeah. But we know... So, for instance, we know that she had teeth extracted when she had bad teeth. That was expensive. We know that when she was ill, she was given asses milk, which was really expensive. We know that her bedroom was hung with chintz that was oiled between this beautiful press. It was extremely um, expensive, costly bed to have. She was given an annuity. Ma- Lord Mansfield gave her a beautiful portrait of himself to hang in her drawing room. She she was brought up as an accomplished young woman and I don't think for one minute they were ashamed of her. Now, this is significant because, as you say, Lord Mansfield was um, the Lord Chief Justice and he was he was trying important cases. Oh. Uh, very significant cases that, I mean sort of pointed the way towards abolition. Yeah. I mean, Just was, tell us what those He were. was an extraordinary man. I mean, he, he was said to be 100 years ahead of his time in, in terms... It was commercial law, insurance law. I mean, he was a phenomenal person. Um, but what he's most famous for is... Um, for the abolition of the slave trade, even though this happened way before he tried an important case called the Somerset case. Um, and in a way, that propelled the abolition movement in the this late was, 18th century. Um, this was the... 1772. And the case was brought... It, it was really to test the proposition that um, it, uh, you couldn't be a slave on British soil. Correct. Once you breathed British air, you were free. Correct. So if, if you were bought as a slave from abroad, yep. the instant you set foot here, yep. you were free well, and it, you that, could not be... Yep. I mean, it was a bit of a back. common misconception and, and it was very ambiguous. So for a lot of slaves, they thought if but just by being baptised, running away to England and being baptised would manumit you, that would make you free. And so these cases were going back and forth and back and forth. And do you, once you set foot in England, breathe the free air of England? And that became the great abolitionist slogan. And Mansfield, to be honest, was stalling on this. So there were all these test cases before Somerset where they're saying, are you set, once you set foot in England, are you free? And then finally, in 1772, he has to make a decision. And, of course, he makes a decision that, indeed, no man should be a he, slave in England. He edges towards it, doesn't he? He has this um, rather shocking, by modern standards statement, I would have all masters think their slaves free and all Negroes think they were slaves because then both would behave better. Better. So he's not quite no, our also, idea of Well, I think, it, I mean, I, I, he also said the state of slavery is so odious. Um, and I mean, there, were, there were some very sort of powerful emotional words that he used about the slave trade. But he was in a very difficult position, not least because he had to support the the, the, uh, the interests of um, the commercial, the merchants. He was very worried about property as well. And who's well, going to pay other... for this? If we set all, if we're going to set everybody free, who pays? And um, so he was This is the other huge torn. case, the huge and shocking case, which is the case of uh, the Zong, Zong, which is an insurance case, not a case about a massacre. I mean, uh, 140 some slaves thrown yeah. overboard, and yeah. then an insurance claim is made for the lost property. And this comes before the court because the insurers say we're not going to pay out. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And and he his part in that is to is to say, well, they weren't property. Yeah. Or. Or to yeah. guide that through. Well, exactly. But, I mean, what you have to understand, and of course, there are limited things that Mansfield can do, but these are moral victories. And what all of these small but significant victories do is propel the abolition movement. So you've got these wonderful people. And, you know, women, women are getting involved in this. There are people like Lady Margaret Middleton who's having these dinner parties and she's propelling this interest in the, in the abolition. There's a woman called Elizabeth Cade and she's, to me, she's a heroine because in the Somerset case, she pays his bail. She... And, and Mansfield says to her, "Look, why don't you just buy him? Just buy him, and we don't have to. We don't have to solve. We don't have to face this issue." Because he wants to put it on he the shelf. He just wants to yeah. put it on the back burner, really, because he knows people are gossiping about yeah. Dido Bell. And she says, "I will not do this. I'm not taking the easy option." So you've got these very. Indiv- strong individual women making a stand and changing yeah. the course of history. Um, Lucy Worsley, this is where um, whether you take sugar in your tea becomes a political, kind of radical political gesture as well at this period, Oh, yes. Is it? it the East Indies or the West Indies that you have to get your sugar from? It's one or the other because they use slaves in one half and not in the other. And half. freed labour in the other. But, um, mm. you know, the, the but a lot of people give up mm. sugar. Anti-saccharides. Mm. Anti-saccharides. Yeah. And Queen Charlotte, famously, mm. there's a great cartoon where she's saying to her children, don't drink sugar in your tea, don't, you know, because we're anti Saccharites. And that's, a, again, women Women buy sugar in the 18th century. If the women boycott the sugar, 
But, but there's also quite Brian, a deal of hypocrisy around because, I mean, in the American War of Independence, George III now, of course, um, the, the, the British commander... Well, first of all, the British governor in Virginia says that all slaves who fight for the British will be, will be granted their freedom. And then a few years later, when that didn't work sufficiently well enough, the British commander says, right, any slave who leaves um, is free automatically in America, even whilst back in the United Kingdom, um, will, um, Lord North... Um, is, you know, ferociously fighting against any suggestion that the slave trade is immoral. Um, we have to wait for the second volume of your biography to get to Wilberforce and the great kind of Not parliamentary battle. Uh, no, long. no, I know it's right at the beginning of your second volume. No, I mean, why? my second volume's out in August. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, right, OK. You don't have to wait very Sorry, <laughs> you were more interested in the plug than the... Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, but... Uh, why why was this led from outside and not from in Parliament? Is it because th within Parliament you just have the vested interests who are protecting the commercial? Well, I mean, fascinatingly, when um, the slave trade is abolished, as opposed to slavery, um, most of the bishops vote to keep slavery, the slave trade, um, and then subsequently, and the Bishop of Exeter, I think, still at the time when slavery is abolished, had 320 slaves. Um, let alone what there was in the you know members of the uh, other members of the House of Commons in the House of House of Lords. So yes, of course, vested yeah. interests. I Rosen. think it's I think it's hard for us to appreciate just how vested the interest in having slavery was because this is the seamy underbelly of all you know the the frippery, the fun, the frivolity of the Georgian age, the dresses, the houses, the gen and the the jelly and the the dinner parties and all of that. It was all powered by the global trade in slavery. So it's not like it's a, a sort of nasty little thing that we can do without. It's absolutely central to Britain's economic... Yeah. How depressing that we completely and utterly failed to keep America. By utter... <laughs> because of the moral corruption that was right at the heart of the parliamentary system, it wasn't fit for purpose um, at that time. That's, we, well, that's, that's a classic case of, law, of, of Parliament getting too strong. Lord North can do what he wants, there's no check. Well, wait, it's, it's, uh, no, it's the monarch <laughs> and the, cr and the, cr uh, and the crown yeah. uh, uh, not listening to uh, some we're, of the... We're, we've run people. out of time. We can't, we can't deal with the loss of America this week, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, thank you to all of my guests. Rupert Gould's production of Charles III is on at the Almeida Theatre in London until the end of May. Paula Burns' Bell and Chris Bryant's Biography of Parliament are both out now. And Lucy Worsley's series on the first Georgian starts on BBC4 on May the 1st. Next week, Anne McElvoy will be discussing Gaia, Sunspots and Wild Boar with James Lovelock, Joanna Hay and George Monbiot. But for now, thank you and goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free. ...and may have played a quiet part in bringing an end to slavery. We start, though, in the arena for some of the most intense battles between ministers and monarchs, the subject of Chris Bryan's book, Parliament, the Biography. Um, Chris, in terms of public esteem, I would guess that uh, royalty has edged ahead of uh, Parliament just at the moment. I, he I actually heard it described as the Palace of Sexminster this morning. Um, your, your biography uh, is explicitly an attempt to redress the balance a bit, isn't it? Well, it's just trying to put it all in context, really. I mean, I, I started because somebody once asked me, who were the very first commoners that we know came to a parliament? And uh, I came across a list uh, in October 1258, 14 names, including Walt Disney's great, 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 great something or other. Um, and, uh, and, and the only reason we know they came to parliament is um, uh, when there were the, uh, the teller for the contents, those in favour of the bill, counted a very fat peer for 10 votes. And so it was, it was won by 57 votes to 55, even though there weren't that many in the room. Um, I'm going to have to press you. It's such a wonderful story. Most listeners will assume it's apocryphal, but the, the, the teller statistics bear it out, don't they? Yes, it's absolutely true. I mean, I've been through the list and counted how many people there were, how many bishops there were, how many peers, how many dukes and, and, and all the rest of it. And there just were not enough people in the room to have made 57 plus 55. Um, we're talking a lot, uh, uh, I mean, we've been talking a lot about scandals. I mean, that's the other uh, uh, element of perspective, that um, when you're talking about expenses, uh, I, was, I was fascinated to read about, you know, a period in which it was more usual for the MPs to pay the electorate. Uh, 
in order to... Um, you were also um, very explicit about how contingent much of this is. We think of it as a sort of glorious progress of, um, of resolute um, advancement towards greater democracy, but there's a lot of chance and contingency in there as well, isn't there? A, a great deal. Well, and the Victorians, I think, deliberately wanted to suggest that it had all been a great progression and towards the, the you know, perfect um, settlement under the, under the British Empire. Um, but if you... I mean, Queen Victoria, for instance, she only became monarch because not only had her father and her grandfather died, but three cousins and three uncles as well. Now, if that wasn't an episode of kind hearts and coronets in the making, I don't know what was. Um, but, but perhaps the best example is habeas corpus, one of the laws that we all rely on, namely that the king cannot arrest you without due reason, without fair trial, um, only came into existence because at third reading in the House of Lords... Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. Just how much nerve does it take to stage a play in Shakespearean blank verse featuring most of the current royal family and several spectral appearances by Princess Diana? Rupert Gould can tell us this morning because he's just done that at the Almeida Theatre in London. Mike Bartlett's King Charles III describes a constitutional crisis triggered after the Prince of Wales steps into his mother's shoes and decides to test the limits of his power. Also on the programme today, constitutional and legal battles in the Georgian period. Lucy Worsley is here to talk about her new television series, The First Georges, in which she argues that the Hanoverians laid the foundations of modern Britain. And the writer Paula Byrne with the fascinating story of a young black woman who lived with one of George II's Lord Chief Justice. Because they had their expenses paid and we've got their expenses sheet, as it were. The king insisted that they be paid. And interestingly... He didn't want them just to be paid two shillings a day, which is what they'd have been paid to go to war, but four shillings a day because he wanted really good people to come to Parliament. Um, so I, I think sometimes we, could, we should just set things in context. Um, and, and the other thing for me was there are so many myths about Parliament. I mean, one of the phrases that gets used and often bastardised is um, Parliament, Westminster is the mother of parliaments. In fact, there was an article in The Guardian the other day that used this yet again. It's never been the mother of parliaments. The oldest... Um, parliament in the world, representative assembly, is the Althingi of Iceland. The Tynwald in the Isle of Man is older than Westminster, and Ireland had statute law before England. So I, I just think sometimes we need to get the facts right so that we can better understand our role in the world. <laughs>